Hotep, and welcome once again to another edition of Community Cop. My name is Noel Lita, one of the co-founder members of 100 Blacks Law Enforcement Care. I'm here today with another co-founder member, Michael Gray, a.k.a. Big Mike. Namaste, brother. And we'd like to welcome, once again, you, our viewing audience. This is where truth and real talk occurs every Tuesday here on Community Cop. Um, as is customary, you want to go right into uh, historical pieces, uh, some, some dates that we want to... Uh, our family members to remember uh, on August 9th, 1997, some of you may remember in New York City, the horrific sodomy of an African-American named Abner Louima inside of the 70 Precinct Station House. He was sodomized with a broomstick by Officer Volpe, along with uh, two or three of his uh, co-partners. Uh, Officer Volpe initially denied the sodomy, but as a result of the injuries uh, that Abner Louima sustained, he was forced to be taken to the hospital where he informed the nurse of what happened inside of the precinct station house. Uh, after that, everything blew up and the whole city and you know e even the whole nation found out uh, actually what happened. Uh, you know, it shocked the conscience of New York City residents that an uh, officer was sodomized, a prisoner inside of a station house with a nice stick and ultimately, of course, uh, Officer Justin Volpe was arrested after an investigation, after officers were forced to come forward who was in the station house and heard the screams and heard even Justin Volpe brag about uh, his uh, devious actions. You know, uh, reports stated that he walked around the station house with feces at the end of the stick that he shoved up at Louima's uh, rectum. It was a horrific incident. It was a horrific um, example of police criminality. Um, and it was a sign of the time. Mayor Giuliani was a mayor at that particular time. And of course, race relations between uh, members of the New York City Police Department and the African American community was at its worst under the leadership of uh, who some people call the nation's mayor, Adolf Giuliani. Uh, Michael, what are your memories of this horrific uh, sodomy? which 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement Who Care came out um, and criticized and denounced uh, the actions of Officer Volpe as well as his three co-partners, as well as the precinct commanding officers and the supervisors that were present, as well as uh, you know the mayor and the police commission. Certainly, uh, I remember this was in the early days of 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement Who Care. This wasn't a local probe. This was a federal investigation. It became a federal investigation. And you initially, maybe maybe the officers in the 7-0 were just a little bit too comfortable because I guess they didn't comprehend or understand fully the gravity of the situation with federal officers that you just can't get in, in front of federal officers and be disrespectful and be dismissive and ultimately just lie to them because that's a criminal offense. That's a federal offense, a felony to lie to federal officers. So as you as you rightfully stated, the boasting that went on, the, uh, the uh, macho attitude and being so dismissive of the federal officers who were making uh, real inquiries as to what happened that night and so um, it, it exploded in their face. They found out in the long run that even though they had air support and cover from the mayor, that was not going to help the mayor, Rudolph Giuliani, as you pointed out, it was not going to help them in a federal courtroom. You know, all of this Giuliani and his antics and his uh, bold support of the police department. Uh, so what happened to Abner Louima was the fact that Abner Nulima lived. Had he died because he did not get medical attention right away, it took the commanding officer that very next morning to ensure that he got medical attention, who was not dead at night when it happened, but saw him curled up in a pen in the, uh, what is that called, the fetal position? Right. And, and made a determination that something is wrong, something's amiss. Consequently, he told the officers to call uh, emergency um, technicians, the ambulance, to the scene. And that's what 
ultimately happened. Um, they tried to pretend that his injuries were due to homosexual activity. That didn't fly. They were looking for a reason and um, just an excuse. But they, again, did not understand the full gravity of what it is to be interviewed by federal officers. Consequently, it led to their downfall uh, as it all came out later uh, when Volpe had to fall on the sword. You know, also the officer who stood uh, watch at the door, the other officers who all participated in helping holding uh, Luima down. Uh, it became an issue. Uh, you had not only the mayor supporting the police officers, you had the um, Staten Island borough president boldly saying that no one's going to jail. So it was um, it was an all out white assault. And it was it was supported by whites in authority. But ultimately, uh, several officers went to jail, much to their dismay. Uh, they didn't see it coming. Uh, but it did come and ultimately uh, in a strange sense, uh, justice was served. And uh, uh, most of us are used, to, especially in the African and Latino community, are used to police criminality or police brutality. But this particular act um, that occurred within the precinct house, they had police officers to drag a prisoner into the bathroom at the precinct house. And many people don't know, but many times the precinct cells are not far away from the, the desk where the supervisor of the precinct sits at. Um, you know, for police officers to drag a, a, a prisoner into the bathroom, pull his pants down and sodomize him with a stick inside of a police precinct, you know, uh, it, it shocked the conscience of many New Yorkers who were, although they understood that police criminality or police brutality did exist, they would never Think that something as grotesque as this uh, would occur, you know, in New York, so-called liberal, so-called progressives, uh, New York City. And uh, I remember Officer Justin Volpe, Volpe, bragging that he broke a man. Those was his exact words. These are the right. kind of words that many of you uh, may remember occurred on the slave plantation when uh, white slave owners wanted to force. Uh, African American, uh, enslaved African American to acquiesce to his wishes, there would be a breaking uh, process. So uh, that occurred, and I believe Officer Volpe is still in jail. Am I right, Michael? Yeah, that's correct. Right, and that's that's exactly. I think he was sentenced to 33, 33 years, something like that. Right. Okay, deservedly. Okay, a next case uh, occurred he on. Tried, as a matter of fact, Noel. He tried to uh, during the uh, the the pandemic. During the pandemic, he uh, attack attempted to get out based on um, COVID nineteen. Right. Okay. But he remains in jail. Okay. On August 9, two thousand and fourteen, uh, many of you may remember another uh, unfortunate incident between police officers and members of the African American community. This is when Michael Brown was shot by officer in Ferguson. Uh, this uh, spurned on a whole lot of protests uh, in Ferguson and nationwide. Uh, many individuals believe that this is when the Black Lives Matter movement was created um, in response to community protests to this horrific shooting. Um, Officer Wilson was ultimately suspended uh, from the police force. I know there was a federal investigation into the Ferguson uh, Police Department uh, under the Department of uh, Barack Obama's Justice Department, they were found. It was supposed to be. <laughs> right. Yeah. They were found to be very abusive of the African-American community. No one was arrested, of course. But Michael, what are your memory, your, me your memory of the killing of brother um, Michael Brown? Well, let me start off with what you just mentioned. Uh, certainly, President um, Barack Hussein Obama wrote a scathing, uh, his Justice Department wrote a scathing letter about the practices of Ferguson. Right. Uh, one person getting five, 10, 12 tickets on one occasion at the same time uh, of traffic violation, violations for just looking at the police officer the wrong way. Uh, they just started making up violations and uh, they started doing it to raise funds for the police department and for the city. Of Ferguson, and so a scathing 
um, uh, report was written by the Justice Department under uh, President Obama, certainly. So you're right about that. There was an investigation, but there was not a prosecution of Darren Wilson. That's the distinction. So I understand why you kind of like laugh because yes, it was a scathing letter. If you was a police officer in Ferguson, you would say, so what? There was no prosecution. So it really didn't matter. The only thing that happened is that Darren Wilson lost his job. That investigation brought out that it was 53 officers and in a black town like Ferguson, literally an all black town like Ferguson, only three of those police officers was black at that time. So you had a lily white police department in a black town uh, just hitting people with all sorts of summons and citations for literally anything under the sun. So that came out during the investigation. Darren Wilson was not charged. He was not charged. And this was a democratic town under a democratic governor. They were protected. It was around re-election time. So the Democratic Party just looked the other way. None of the civil rights organizations went after the governor, went after the local elected officials, primarily because corporations um, pay the bills for uh, civil rights organizations. They are all under control then. They are all under control right now as we speak. And it's been that way, if, if not always was that way, Nixon made it crystal clear, pay Uncle Tom's, give them the money, toll corporations, you have to, uh, uh, what is called meritorious manumission, you know, uh, reward them, reward them when they sell their, their community down the tubes. Consequently, this is what happened in Ferguson. And, um, this is why after that, they had to change the city council some and allow a few black people to, to run for office. A couple of changes made, a few more police officers came on, but when all is said and done, justice was not done for the Brown family. The perpetrator uh, did not uh, get convicted of anything. Uh, he knows full well that he arrested Michael Brown because Michael Brown was what is commonly called jaywalking. It was no crime, in fact. Uh, that's not a criminal act. That's, um, what is it, a violation? Violation, yeah. So Traffic he was problems. what is called jaywalking. And the police took offense to it and made it an issue. A non, he made a non-issue an issue. And ultimately, Michael Brown was, was killed that day with his hands up. That's why they're saying hands up, don't shoot, came in the fashion and his body laid there for well over three hours, three and a half hours in the street, which uh, incensed the Ferguson community and was the, the spark that showed a level of resistance that we have never seen in our lifetime in um, Black America. And Michael, it's interesting going back to the what the Justice Department found out about the uh, city and the town of Ferguson is that, you know, they had memo documents from the uh, administrators uh, of Ferguson stating, listen, we need to raise X amount of millions of dollars, uh, you know, target the African-American community, you know, bombard them with summonses because uh, what the Justice Department found out is that the black community in Ferguson uh, was bombarded um, uh, I, I don't know what what uh, percentages they represented of the whole town or the whole city, but they represented a overwhelming majority of the amount of summonses uh, that was uh, the police off the police department had hit this town with the black community with, and the justice department found out it was intentional. Whenever they wanted to raise money, because it only didn't happen once, it happened over a number of years. That's right. They would say, "Listen, we got to bombard bombard this community." with you know, X amount of summonses. And of course, if we don't pay a summons, that, summons, that turns into a warrant. <clears throat> and even Michael, when you talk about um, this particular officer um, approaching Michael Brown for allegedly jaywalking, uh, you know, he could have, you know, because before the shooting occurred and the Justice Department did the investigation, we didn't even know about this attempt by police department to raise revenues by by stopping African-Americans and giving them summons for some of the most minuscule offenses. So this could have been 
um, uh, uh, you know, responsible. That officer could have just been doing what they have been doing. That you see African American violate what you consider, you know, a violation or anything. Approach them, and uh, these subtle approaches, these nonviolent, non-criminal approaches by police officers, many times throughout the nation, result in some horrific, uh, you know, incident. You know, so that's why we are totally against it. But you know, uh, Noel, well, could you could you explain what jaywalking is? Just in case some of our listeners don't know what that is. Well, jaywalking is simply a traffic infraction. And sometimes, you know, it's something that occurs everywhere. Everyone, you know, at one time or the other jaywalks. This is when you, you know, you cross uh, from one side of the street to the other, um, as opposed to going directly across the street that you're going to, you make like a U-turn without actually touching, you know, that particular sidewalk. Um, they want you to go from north to south and then go east or west as opposed to just, you know. In other words, what term. you're saying is that no one walks all the way to the corner to cross the street. Very really, very really. You know, this jaywalking, you know, what I would say is jaywalking is very common, you know, amongst everybody in every city and every town, you know. Uh, but in terms of heavy handedness, I would say that if it's going to, if it's anybody's going to get a summons, it's going to be somebody in the Black or Latino community, especially the Black community. Yes, yes, and um, and also just wanted to point out that that level of resistance was so strong. You saw black men, women, and young people, they normally say don't care about anything. Well, they came out for Michael Brown. They really demanded justice. Darren Seals and so many other uh, organically linked uh, black leaders surfaced. These were brothers and sisters, some of them, that were more into rapping and different things, but they put the rapping to the side, a lot of other things to the side, uh, beefs to the side, and all demanded justice. That movement was co-opted by the organization naming itself Black Lives Matter, but Darren Seals made it clear, do not connect them with Black Lives Matter, that they were, uh, a lesbian based organization of homosexuals. He also made it clear that this was about justice for, uh, for, for um, Michael Brown. He made that crystal clear. And um, this also showed officers from surrounding police agencies, six or seven police agencies uh, came to the, to the rescue for the uh, Ferguson Police Department and they had on fatigues. They, they had highly mechanized weapons that came out. It was President Obama himself that saw how embarrassing this look that a black community of 20,000 was under siege by several police departments from all over. And they were actually wearing fatigues, fully automatic weapons. They had tanks. Uh, they had sound equipment that could bust your eardrums. Everything under the sun was on display. And he told them, demanded, one of the few times Obama did anything worth even mentioning, that he told them to take off the fatigues because it looked like uh, uh, a conquering army coming into a black community, aiming weapons at people, demanding that they get off the street. So I can't give him credit for that because he was covering up for them because it really came out what a police department, even a small police department like Ferguson can do if they have to, that shows you the expertise and the mutual assistance that they get from surrounding police departments now uh, is all because of the so-called threat of the black community, while the real threat is white extremists, white militias, they do these exercises because uh, they, they're doing it targeting the black community. And it's interesting that you, you bring that up, uh, Michael, uh, Barack Obama's response to the heavy handedness, the heavy handedness by the Ferguson authorities. You know, this is, and, and uh, brother uh, Michael Brown's death uh, at the hands of police officers is so significant because it brought so much awareness to the problem of police criminality or police brutality throughout the nation. You know, and we've learned so much, you know, not only did we learn about the uh, government officials targeting the black community in Ferguson to raise revenue with summonses and arrests, 
Um, not only did uh, the, the community come together uh, like it really did uh, prior to that in terms of in response to uh, police uh, criminality, uh, you had the Black Lives Matter movement. And as you stated, uh, this is one of the first times that the nation had the opportunity to see police officers and police departments and police agencies respond to a civilian community as if they were in a war zone. As you said, they had, you know, not police uniforms, they had fatigue. You would think that they were, you know, uh, in, in the desert, uh, in Iraq or Iran or in Afghanistan. Um, and it was outrageous. They had tanks, they had superior weapons, and this was a civilian crowd. And we had one time a community cop explained the difference between the police department and the military, although police departments are paramilitary organizations, the objective, primary objective of police departments is to save lives. The primary, primary objective of the military is to take lives. So to see military uh, forces in the civilian community in the streets of the United States of America was shocking uh, to many. And then we've learned that uh, when the military had old weapons and old vehicle, military vehicles, that they would ask in police departments around the country, yo, do y'all want these before we get rid of them? And uh, police agencies throughout the country was grabbing up these uh, military uh, weapons and vehicles, you know, ad nauseum uh, until it was, like you said, the Obama administration said, oh, no, 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 we can't do this. You know, this is not, um, doesn't look good. It's not a good practice to have these military weapons and vehicles in the civilian uh, community. Close the words on this. Anything else? Yeah, I would say he did that not because of love for Black people. He did that because the world was watching. CNN and MSNBC, all of them were showing that. So people all over the world saw LRADs, MRAPs, highly mechanized weapons on display in the back community. And it showed them aiming weapons, shooting tear gas, which is illegal uh, into civilian um, crowds. It just showed you so much that President Obama had to come in and sort of uh, temper things a little bit, not so much that he loved black people, but again, because that image went all over the world and we got to see real black men and women, uh, strong, of great character, demanding justice. And this was not a uh, part of the civil rights movement. If anything, it was showing black power. Right. Okay. Uh, fast forward to another incident, 8-14-1908, the Springfield, Illinois uh, race riot. Mike? I'll just say briefly with that, this was the actual race riot, riot where Blacks were actually being hung in the street. Blacks were actually being shot on sight. White mobs was roaming the streets with shotguns. Uh, with rifles, sidearms, all on the so-called uh, allegation that a white woman was raped, which she wasn't, it was just a lie. But they roamed the streets of Illinois in 1908. It was so bad that uh, Ovington and others, Mary White and others, these were the people that formed, these were uh, white people that formed the NAACP, because of what they saw in, in Springfield, Illinois, caused them to come all the way back to New York and go upstate to the Niagara movement, where the most prominent Blacks uh, in the country was meeting, and got them to come on board and finance the uh, start of the NAACP, which they controlled, by the way, because they controlled the money and they basically picked the leadership, but they got the biggest names at that time of black leaders. And out of the uh, Springfield, Illinois riots uh, came the NAACP from um, the Niagara movement, which was a, a black organization, an all black organization. It morphed into the present day NAACP. And for a point of clarity, Michael, because um, very frequently at uh, Community Cop, when we do our historian piece, we talk about one of the horrific, one of many horrific race riots that occurred in, in, uh, in this country. You know, can you clarify for our viewing audience that you're not repeating yourself every week about the same riot, <laughs> just for those who, 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 who may not be able to believe 
uh, the history of America and how frequent these things occurred. You know, there was more than the Wall Street, uh, you know, riot or mass murder. Well, look, just pick a state and we will tell you what city it went down in. We're going to mention another one, by the way, but in any event, all you have to understand is that anytime, and you pointed this out a lot of times, Noel, anytime there has been Black progress and pe Black people pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, there was always white blowback. So if you're doing well, if you're trading with each other, if you're creating businesses where you're financing and patronizing each other, whites just are uh, enraged by black progress. Uh, let's say like, if you're talking about Rosewood or if you're talking about uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, black people had fine silverware, they had pianos, things that white farmers just cherished and could not have and to see them walking around in their Sunday best in places like uh, in North Carolina, when the Democratic Party took over uh, an election and just threw everybody out of office, started killing people, killing police officers, pulling them out of their agency, sheriffs, what have you. All of it is primarily due to Black progress. When Black people progress too well, uh, whites have a problem with it and really start going to their guns. But when you're not doing well, then they talk about you like a dog saying that you, um, you're you non-productive and you're lazy and you're criminals. So mm. all of these riots that occurred, the thing that they know enrages whites more than anything is the black man with a white woman. So even when there wasn't a situation like that, they created a fishtail that by the end of that day, whites were already grabbing their guns and killing people. So this is not a replay of anything else. If I say Springfield, Illinois, I'm talking about Springfield, Illinois. I'm not talking about North Carolina or Texas or somewhere else, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. They had these things all over. Here in New York, the 1863 uh, Irish race riots, when Irish were enraged that they were getting drafted into the Civil War, they started killing every black they can find. So it, 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 it sounds so similar, but eerily, it happened time and time again. So I'm not surprised by Ferguson, that's just law enforcement. I'm not surprised uh, by seeing Bloody Sunday when uh, law enforcement beat the hell out of uh, peaceful people who got off a bus or people that walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. So whether you pick the Freedom Riders or those who walk, that, uh, walk uh, uh, across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, it's happened time and time again, and we could do a show every week <laughs> if we chose to. Facts, facts. Real quick, Michael, the Watch Rebellion that caught, occurred on August 11th, 1965. Here, here you have it again. You have a situation that was explosive already because the police department was really heavy handed with the people in Watts and LA. Uh, so you had a situation where it was just a brother driving a car, allegedly uh, erratic. The police department, um, police officers pulled him over. And in pulling him over, he was in the car with his brother. They got real physical with them right, on, right down the block from his house. The black people were familiar with them, uh, took offense to the, the police, beating them up. Uh, they ran and got his mother. His mother came out when the police officers put that uh, nightstick on the on the mother. That's when everything exploded because they beat her up. So the rumor was that they beat up a pregnant uh, woman at that time, a black woman at the time. They did beat her. I don't know if she was pregnant, but in any event, they got physical. They should have just made the arrest, took the car, and that would have been the end of it. But to beat them in the street caused a, a, a legendary uh, race riot, and that was whites uh, just getting excessive with blacks. So for a five to six day period, there was unrest, and then it was brought under control with the National Guard, of course. But um, it only shows you that uh, police agencies 
when they're heavy handed, instead of just being responsible and delegate and, and um, show some restraint, they just get so bold and get out of hands that they just start beating people up and then it explodes and you say, why did it happen this time? Well, the why is because it was happening all the time. Consequently, people can take for so much. Some people call it the straw that uh, broke the camel's back. Right. Our last historical uh, piece, Michael, in August of 1906, we had the Brownsville incident uh, involving Black uh, military soldiers. Yeah, that one, again, and we could do so many pieces on what happened to Black ser soldiers serving the, the country under the flag of the United States. In this particular case, in Brownsville, uh, Texas, a white man, a bartender, was killed late at night after work, and a police officer was wounded. Now, this was done by whites in the town of Brownsville. Right. The town people, instead of allowing one of their own to be prosecuted, they blamed it on the 25th Cavalry, who was stationed outside of the town. They were all in their barracks. Their commanding officer said, every black uh, soldier was accounted for on the base at that time. And the captain said it, the commanding officer said they were all there. Well, Theodore Roosevelt, the president of America, chose to discharge 167 black soldiers, saying that they were responsible for the, for the death of a bartender and also for the wounding of a police officer. Now they know full well that maybe the police officer might have killed the bartender, the bartender might have shot back and wounded him, or somebody could have shot them both. But the black people, the black soldiers that were stationed outside of that town had nothing to do with this. And this was in 1908. Well, what happened? This went all the way to, um, in 1906, pardon me, this went all the way to 1972, where finally, even though president after president knew that they were innocent, it became an issue during the time of Nixon. Nixon reinstituted all the dishonorary discharges uh, post-mortem, they were, they were dead. Only one officer was still alive during that time. And he did not receive back pay. Those officers' families did not receive back pay. The only thing they did was, he was um, near death anyway, so that he didn't have to pay uh, tax-free. Um, he was tax-free the rest of his short life. He was the only one that was lit alive, but the other 166 of them had died since 1906. And we're, we're talking all the way to 1972. So you're talking about 66 years later, they were all uh, discharged from the army. And when you're discharged dishonorably, you cannot get a federal jobs where at least as a soldier, you can get a job in a post office and things like that. They were denied that and they left the uh, army in disgrace and only one were able to get uh, reinstated at the end of his life. So that only shows you justice delayed is justice denied. All right. Uh, and as we fast forward, one of the common threads in many of the rebellions that occurred throughout the history of the United States uh, in, in African-American community, was, and we talked about the straw that broke the camel's back as this police criminality, which some call police brutality. Uh, Unfortunately, um, police departments throughout the nation have not learned the lesson as we repeatedly, week after week or daily, see acts of police criminality uh, occur more frequently, uh, you know, today. You know, so as a society, we haven't learned anything. And one of the primary reasons is because we believe police commissioners and mayors haven't been aggressive in, in prosecuting and punishment, punishing every police officer that's involved. But recently there was a case in Detroit where a police officer was suspended after he punched a, a man named Marcus Alston in the face, knocking him out, and then um, walking behind him, lifting, sitting him up in a sitting position, putting his knee in his back. And when Mr. Allen uh, 
regained consciousness, the officer just simply walked away. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Austin had his hands up when the officer approached him. Uh, and so it was definitely unjustified. Unfortunately, he was sus suspended with pay uh, while they conduct an investigation. I don't know when you have a video uh, what there is to investigate. Um, and of course, as is customary, uh, police authorities are attempting to talk about what Mr. Austin might have did prior to the officer walking up to him and punching him in the face and knocking him out, which is really has nothing to do with the officer's actions. You know, there's no justification. If somebody's standing there with their hands up, you know, um, they're telling you that they don't, you know, they're not presenting a threat to you. Uh, for an officer to knock a person out and then after doing that, uh, while surrounded by other officers, just simply walk away is is, is un unprofessional and it's criminal. It's not an administrative infraction. So we look forward to the day when the officer, he should be arrested. Uh, but as I stated, you know, the supervisor should, uh, you know, other officers were present. Uh, no one did anything. You know, he's when, it, when it, uh, Mr. Austin regained consciousness, uh, you know, he just let him walk away. He wasn't arrested. Um, now, uh, officials are attempting to say that, uh, you know, he might be arrested as, you know, he might have assaulted the police officer prior to what we've seen on the video, which, um, you know, I find hard to believe because if someone assaulted an uh, officer, uh, he should have been arrested on the spot. He would have been arrested on the spot. So um, these uh, police police abuse cases, uh, one more case I just want to talk about real quick in Atlanta, Sergeant Mark Deador, uh was fired after he was caught on video kicking a handcuffed female on the ground. The unfortunate case things about both of these instances is the aggressive officer was African American. You know, so um, you know, some officers uh once they put on the badge, they lose themselves, they lose their identity. I agree with you uh one thousand percent that um unfortunately he lost his identity. I'm sure he had identity and he lost that in that process because he's in the encirclement and in an environment where it's common practice. So he found himself doing the same thing to black people, what white people do to black people. And that's just uh, very unfortunate that we adopt to that culture, a culture of disrespect um, and opportunism. Um, anytime that you're dealing with black people, it's a shame that um, he uh, adhered to that and this is why I believe every law enforcement person, uh, police officers, sheriffs, marshals, correction officers, court officers, parole officers, they should all belong to a black fraternal order. Consequently, you have someone that can talk sharp to you in a collective body to let you know that you black before you blue. And, and that, that understanding needs to make, be made clear on a regular basis so you don't fall into an alien culture that that will destroy the black community that will destroy black families okay all right um uh, another thing is noteworthy uh many of you may realize that the olympics which occurred in japan is is now over um unfortunately it was a a very different olympics because of covid 19 virus you know there was a uh, very little, if any, uh, fan participation, uh, very few audiences. But uh, something happened, a few things happened that's no worthy of, of mentioning, but one in particular we want to talk about today, uh, there was a sister athlete uh, from Namibia um, who was successful. I believe she was a, a track star. I don't know what she, what she actually ran, but she was successful. And after being successful, after blowing out a competition, a representative from the Polish uh, um, uh, uh, individual participants uh, complained to authorities and questioned her gender. Uh, they say that uh, they wanted to ver verify that she was actually a, a female, something that is outrageous. Michael, uh, why don't you talk about that? Yeah, his name is um, Marcin Urbis. He's um, a former Olympic athlete representing Poland, and um, and he also is a Polish uh, sprint coach. So he coaches sprinters. And um, he felt that the sister from um, Namibia, her name is Christine Mboma. 
he felt that she it need they needed to have what he called a sex affirming test, a sex affirming test, because um he didn't believe that she could be so skinny and run so fast to be so explosive. Now she didn't win, she got the silver medal. The sister that won was Elaine Thomas Hurrah, that mean sister from um Jamaica. Now that Jamaican team is always legendary, the men and the women. And so uh, he didn't have a problem, at least he didn't express a problem with Elaine Thomas Hurrah um, winning because her features, you know, nobody's gonna even question whether she's a woman or not, uh, just based on her physique and her looks. Uh, but with the sister from the Namibia, who's jet black, and I do mean jet black, uh, he questioned her. Now, how does a Polish coach judge what gives him the authority to judge the original people of the planet and decide who's a woman and who's a man and to say that the way she was moving, he said she was eight, just 18 years old and she came within a microsecond actually because the sister from Jamaica broke a world record that day. She would have also broken a, a current world record that day. They they was both so fast and pushed each other that that champion from Jamaica barely beat her. It was almost neck and neck the whole way. So he questioned the sister from Namibia because her physique was totally different. It was, you know, what well, I guess you would say an uh, off remark, like she's skin and bones, but she can run. And so he questioned her femininity and um, and wanted a, a real affirmative test. And cause he said that at 18, he could not run as fast as she could run. He later set a, a, a record for Poland. Well, she wasn't running against Poland. She was running for a world record, her and the sister from Jamaica. So that little spot of dust that they call Poland, it meant nothing to those sisters who were competing on a world level. You have a, a, a situation where uh, he has put himself in a position where he thinks he can critique black athletes based on the way they look and on the level of their performance, which to me, it just shows you uh, the sickness of white supremacy. Mm, yeah, well, uh, you know, thanks for pointing that particular story out. Um, uh, we want to switch channels uh, today uh, in New York State, Governor Andrew Cuomo, uh, who was facing impeachment uh, inquiry, announced that he was, uh, his attendance are resigning in 14 days. Uh, many of you may know here on Community Cop, we've talked about an investigation of sexual assault uh, that the New York State Attorney General would, had conducted and found uh, credible um, those women who had made the accusations against uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo. Uh, since that uh, announcement by the New York State Attorney General, Letitia James, there's been a, a mounting pressure for Governor Cuomo to resign. Uh, well, today, after initially rebuffing uh, all calls for his resignation, he decided it was in his best interest to resign, so he decided to step down. Uh, here on Community Cop, we uh, look at this particular particular scenario, and we called it at one time the chickens coming home to roost, because um, his office and his supporters were part of those who made false allegations against the first black governor of New York State, uh, uh, David Patterson. Uh, so, uh, Michael, um, any opinions on the governor's decision uh, to, to step down today? Of course, being threat, threatened with impeachment uh, hearings uh, is somewhat a motivation for him. Uh, initially, he was arrogant and resisted uh, calls for him to step down. Uh, what are your feelings about his decision? Well, let me first uh, say that I, I concur with your assessment 
that this is the chickens coming home to roost, which is what Malcolm um, pointed out with respect to President Kennedy at that time. He said the chickens coming home to roost. Well, you're absolutely right when you say this is the chickens coming home to roost because his office, the attorney general's office, the same one that critiqued uh, his behavior in a report that just came out. Well, he, he had that office and he was making up, his office was making up a, re, a report about uh, allegations about David Patterson, uh, which was um, not correct, just made up stories about uh, sexual innuendos inside the office, uh, inside of rooms where you keep extra material, claiming he was having sex there, talking about drugs, talking about rendezvous um, in New Jersey, across the George Washington um, Bridge, you know, things like that. They made up all these salacious um, statements and tried to get him to step down, not only not run again, but to step down at that time. So, and it was coming out of the attorney general's office. So this is the chickens hum coming home to roost that the damning report came from the attorney general's office on him. First black governor is being removed by somebody that wanted his job. Now, all these political enemies over the years that he's bullied, some, somebody out there wants his job so they were able to uh, organize and coalesce 11 women to come forward, which they did. And um, normally he would bulldoze anybody who tried to make those statements against him. But in this particular case, it became overwhelming. And once he saw that he did not have the support of the legislature, that they were in fact going to impeach him, which is totally different from the Republican Party. Now, the Republican Party, it doesn't matter. In the words of Donald Trump, if he walked yeah. down Fifth Avenue Back. and shot somebody, nothing would happen to him. The people would just say, it's OK. That person probably deserved it. So in this particular case, even if the evidence is not overwhelming, because some of it was lightweight. Now, make no mistake about it. I am no supporter of Governor, Governor Andrew Cuomo. I am keenly aware that him and Mario Cuomo played a role in the air cover of support of six white men who raped Tawana Brawley. So don't watch this show and say I'm supporting him in any way. I know that those were lightweight things. A lot of it was lightweight when you're shaking somebody's hand and maybe you hold that hand extra second or two. If your hand touch somebody's waist, if you ask an intrusive question as to what is that person doing that night? When the last time you did such and such, you know, maybe you need a little something, that kind of stuff. That stuff is um, out of order. And that once a woman lets you know that they find it offensive, you were supposed to immediately stop. I understand that. But very rarely will you ever seen somebody uh, step down from an office that powerful or for some of these things that are being done. When that office under his father gave air cover to six white men who kidnapped and raped Tawana Brawley over a three day period, six white men, the proof the evidence is overwhelming. The white uh, mailman who saw the abduction, who gave three out of the six characters and described the car that she was hoisted into, that was in fact their license plates. When they claimed that at that time they were out of town shopping in late November, when you know men do not shop for Christmas presents in November. They claim that they all got together and left town and they were all out shopping. What men organized a shopping expedition 
for Christmas a month before it happens. It just doesn't happen. Uh, they were identified the very same disease that they gave uh, to Tawana Brawley. Uh, one of them had it, gave it to her. That's a medical, that's medical evidence to that effect. The evidence is overwhelming. Uh, some of the other things with the police officer, I can't go into it all now, but a police officer was killed because of the role he played and then his failure to do X, Y, and Z. I can't explain it all to you now, but on another occasion, we have the time, I will. He was killed. And yet this, this case, it only it takes the governor's office to cover up this whole thing that happened with Tawana Brawley. I know most of you didn't know that a police officer was killed in that process, but one was. So in any event, the air cover that was given to protect those men who were very prominent and powerful, some of them were officers, some of them were uh, district attorneys and whatever, they all were prominent and friends of the governor. So this is chickens coming home to roost. And, um, and I guess I'll stop there just by saying that it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. And going back to the uh, uh, Governor Cuomo incident, two things I want to mention for the record, as it relates to uh, former Governor David Patterson, he was vindicated of all these false, bogus accusations. That's None right. of them ever amounted to sexual abuse. Even the sexual uh, allegations that were made from him uh, was, was, was consensual. Uh, uh, but he was vindicated, uh, and we understand the objective was just to get him not to run uh, for re-election, number one, allow them to write up the budget. And, uh, you know, and then also I wanted to, um, the last point I want to make is, uh, you know, as it relates to your comment, uh, Michael, how Republicans respond to accusations against uh, leaders within the Republican Party and how Democrats uh, act. Um, uh, President Donald Trump had the same allegations made against him uh, by the same amount of women. Um, with uh, Donald Trump, they had arrogant tape recordings of him ad admitting that he grabbed women by their private parts. But yet he did get cover from other Republicans. So there's a lot of validity when you make the comparison between uh, how Democrats uh, respond or do or do not protect, uh, you know, uh, their hierarchy and how Republicans uh, respond as well. So I just wanted to make that point. Yes, yes, and um, it is it is just ironic that it happened to him because with all the years and time and effort we put into uh, eradicating stop questioning Frisk, we were told by his office when he was the Attorney General that if we do not support Patterson, our wish will be granted. They said, we can stop, stop questioning Fritz tomorrow. Said, just don't support Patterson. We were on our way up to the Harlem State Office building, at, um, the Adam Clayton Powell uh, building to support David Patterson and to dismiss all these lies and fabrications on Patterson. And they in turn told us that if we do not support Patterson, because they just had a meeting, they were uh, going to have a meeting at Sylvia's, the black leadership. They were under orders, they were under orders to give a thumbs down to Patterson. I'm gonna say that one more time, Noel. I know we only got five minutes left, but mm -hmm. I need to say this again without uh, explaining it, but the black leadership, all yeah. the black elected officials huddled. They were told by, by uh, Andrew Cuomo in the attorney general's office to have a meeting and do a thumbs down on Patterson's leadership. And those coons actually went to the meeting at Sylvia's. And David Patterson, David Dinkins, who's the godparents of David Patterson, asked them not to do it because of his love for his godson, but most of the people there were under orders. That all, that uh, meeting was organized by the Reverend Alfred Sharpton. Again, Reverend Alfred Sharpton under orders from Cuomo called all the black elected officials 
to Sylvia's for a meeting to do a thumbs down on David Patterson. And I wish I had more time to explain it, but I'm gonna stop there. Right, okay. Uh, two things we want, I want to discuss uh, further. The first thing is uh, I want your, your, your point of view. Um, many of you watch CNN uh, right here and uh, journalist Don Lennon called for uh, rules be put in place that actually forces American citizens, citizens to take the vaccination, the COVID uh, vaccination. Uh, CNN clearly has a fixation, uh, you know, with uh, promoting the vaccine, uh, which is fine if that's what they want to do. Uh, but uh, Don Lennon uh, last week up the ante, you know, he wants the government to make rules that forces uh, citizens, some who even have a, a objection to the vaccine, to force citizens to put this into their bodies. A quick a response, we have one more story that I know you wanted to get to. What is your response to his publicly stating that that's what he feels should happen? Well, I think he's a company man. Uh, Don Lemon has always been a company man. Uh, I saw him only come out forcefully after what he saw happen uh, in, in Charlottesville. I've never heard him speak out on anything with any conviction until Charlottesville when that white woman was killed by uh, right wing uh, militias and terrorists. So before that, he's always been a company man. So I'll just say that that's where Biden is going and he's getting resistance from the Florida governor and others from the Republican party who's not having it. They're right. not going to allow themselves mm -hmm. to be bullied into a vaccination that they know is not a real uh, vaccine. My objection to the CNN, one of my objections to CNN coverage of this whole subject of the vaccine and coronavirus is that just one way. Like there's doctors who disagree with the vaccine, there's doctors who have questions about what's in the vaccine and the potential uh, uh, repercussions long term of the vaccine, the, um, the history of the vaccine as well. But uh, Michael, close us out with just a quick minute because we have to go. Uh, what happened in Orangeburg, South Carolina, where a police officer beat up a 59-year-old man? Real quick, because we, we only have about two. OK, minutes. well, I, let me just say that, you know, with respect to time, and they can get the rest on YouTube, black man, black woman, protect the black child, accept your own and be yourself. Uh, and you can use your final words, and then we can just talk about it. OK, I'd like to say, uh, to uh, on behalf of Community Cop, we'd like to thank our engineer, Brian. Uh, Veronica Kitt, Nat Woods, Sheila Berry, Big D. Uh, we'd like to also thank you, our viewing audience. You can catch these programs on YouTube, just bunch of community cop. We ask us to like, share, and describe when you watch the video. And Michael? Yeah, just want to say with respect to uh, what happened in Orangeburg, police officer uh, David, David Lance Dukes. I don't know if he's related to the other David Dukes. David, <laughs> David Lance Dukes. What he did was, he what he did was he um got a call. A black man was walking. A black man who had recently got into a very bad uh, accident riding his bike. A car hit him, and he had pins and rods in his leg, and he was walking with a cane very deliberately, very slow. Uh, allegedly, there was a phone call saying that he might be carrying a weapon. So uh, he comes up to the man, and the man's name is Clarence uh, Gellyard. He's 58 years old, an old man and, um, who uh, has a bad leg injury, came up to him and demanded that he get, out, get down on the ground. Well, the man could not get down on the ground fast because of the uh, disability in his leg. Consequently, he... Uh, took him down to the ground, slammed his head into the concrete, and it was caught on videotape. So he has been dismissed from his job only once the uh, video footage became, um, uh, it came back to the department that uh, what he had wrote was not in fact what happened, that he slammed the guy's head down. So he's been dismissed as we speak. And that only shows you again that Case after case, you don't have a leg to stand on if there's no video, if there's um no video footage. Luckily, there was video footage because he showed on his camera only after the person was cuffed 
it shows eight seconds of him with the person cuff, but it doesn't show you what he did prior to. So um, again, video footage. If you don't have video footage uh, against um, a police officer, you're in a world of trouble. All right. Okay. Thank you for watching. See you next and, week. That's what I just want to mention. Again, the passing of Dr. Renoko Rashidi. We lost a real giant. This is a black man who dedicated his whole life, his whole life to traveling. He was a globe trotter. He went all over the world showing the black presence uh, in Asia, in Europe, uh, in the Hawaiian Islands. You name a place, uh, Dr. Renoko Rashidi went there and showed you the black origins of all of those places. He went in Asia and, and China in places and showed you the black presence there uh, in antiquity. So just want to say again, um, we lost a giant. Dr. Renoko Rashidi, uh, one of the great ones uh, that comes into uh, a line, a great pantheon of great historians where we lost another one. So to those who believe in the concept of ancestors, we have another ancestor looking out for us now. All right. Peace.